With a message from God's Word, here's Charles Stanley. Do you want God's full blessing that He's planned for you, or are you just sort of willing to get along the best you can and just sort of take what's coming your way and never even stop to think about what would God do in my life if He had full control of it? What are the possibilities of the ways I could be blessed if I let God do it His way? You see, most Christians are not very happy with their Christian life. They struggle over this and they struggle over that and they complain about God doesn't answer my prayer and my needs are not all being met and God is not giving me the desires of my heart and they moan and they groan and they complain about the Christian life's not what it's all cracked up to be and on and on and on they go. Never stopping to ask the question, wonder why things don't work out right for me. Wonder why God doesn't seem to be favoring me. Why am I not experiencing all these blessings? Well, there is a reason. And that's what I want to talk about in this message. And if you will listen very carefully and follow some scriptures that I want to give in this passage, God can absolutely change your life, revolutionize your life, change your sense of circumstances, and change the flow of the blessings of God in your life. You say, well, how can you promise me that? Well, I don't have to promise you that. All I have to say is this. Here's what God says. He has never lied. You can bet your life. In fact, all of us who are believers, we bet more than our life. We bet our whole eternal life on Him. And those of us who've been saved a long time, we've lived long enough to watch what God does, how He operates, and how His ways work out in our lives. We know He will keep His Word, not to the last breath, but through all eternity. I want you to turn, if you will, to Romans chapter 12. And the title of this message is God's Condition for His Full Blessing. There is a condition in order to experience God's full blessing in our life. You say, well, now, what do you mean by full blessing? Here's what I mean. I mean to be able to experience all that God has planned for your life. Well, what is that? Here's what it is. It's whatever he knows is best in every single area of your life. He's a good God. He has the best in store. The issue is, do I want his best? Or am I willing to take, not God's second best, because he offers no second best, but am I willing to be satisfied with far less than? God wants to give. God wants to reveal. God wants to give of himself or whatever abundance he wants to send our way. Are you willing to take less when you can have the very best? Well, Romans chapter 12, these first two verses. He says, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is. What's that? that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Now, when Paul begins this passage by saying, therefore, to what he's doing, he's referring to everything he's written from chapter 1 all the way through these first 11 chapters, and he's been talking about the sinful and helpless condition of mankind, God's justifying, redeeming, saving, forgiving work on the cross, the indwelling presence and the power of the Holy Spirit to enable us to live the Christian life, and now he comes and he talks about his mercy that he's bestowed upon us, shown us mercy and he says now therefore on the basis of all that god has done for us he says i beseech you i urge you i plead with you to present your body a living holy sacrifice acceptable to god which is the reasonable right thing to do and he says stop allowing yourself to be poured in the world's mold he says that's not the best way the best way is god's way a sacrifice now, with that in mind, I want to talk about this one condition in order to receive God's full blessing. There are not many conditions. There's one ultimate condition that is the bottom line to receive God's best. And when you look, look, look at this passage, it's very evident here that God's condition for full blessing calls for a full surrender. God's condition for a full blessing calls for a, listen, calls for a full surrender. What does he say? I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your body. He's not simply talking about your physical body, but that's your whole being, body, soul, and spirit, the total being, as a sacrifice, living, holy sacrifice, acceptable to God. 
Now, when you think about sacrifices, for example, usually the word sacrifice or surrender or yield are very threatening words to some people. In other words, they want to talk about God's love, God's goodness, God answers prayer, God's kindness, God's mercy, and on and on we go. But when you start talking about sacrifice, when you start talking about surrender, when you start talking about yielding, these are rather threatening words because the implication is that somebody is about to get into my business. Somebody is about to want to control my life. Somebody is about to want to tell me how to operate. And so therefore, all of us like our freedom. We don't want anybody controlling us, dominating us, telling us what to do, how to go about it. We want freedom. What we don't realize is the freest people in the world are those who have come to the place in life to recognize that the life fully surrendered to Almighty God is the freest life of all. So when you go back in the Old Testament, you look at those sacrifices, people would bring their sacrifices, animals or something else that they had grown or whatever it might be, and they offered them to God. Now, a sacrifice is something that we give to another, either as an act of worship or as a gift, uh, as an offering. And so the offerings were given, and when that sacrifice was made, that sacrifice was made in this manner. You had to relinquish, you had to give it up, uh, you had to surrender it. And so, for example, let's say the sacrifice because of sin. Someone would bring their lamb and uh, as an offering for sacrificial offering for their sin, they would place it in the hands of the priest. When they placed that offering in the hands of the priest and he cut the throat of that lamb, laid it on the altar of sacrifice, the person who was offering the sacrifice for the forgiveness of their sin couldn't go back and take that lamb back. Once it was given, it was relinquished. It was taken away. Couldn't go take it back. When people gave offerings as acts of worship, they wouldn't go take the offering back, the sacrificial offering back. It was given over. It was surrendered. It was yielded. And so what he's saying at this point, which his Roman readers would certainly have understood, and that is when he says, I beseech you to present your bodies, to make a presentation, to make an offering. An offering of what? Our whole being, body, soul, and spirit to Almighty God through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He said uh, an offering, a sacrifice that is holy, that is one that is separated and given unto God for the purposes of God. He says a living sacrifice, one that can mean something, one that can be used of Almighty God. He says that's the reasonable right thing to do for the children of God to live in such a fashion that their life is a sacrificial offering to Almighty God. Now, in order for that to happen, a person has to change their lifestyle. Here's what he says. He says now, and he puts this in a, uh, in a form that says, stop being conformed to the world. He says, stop allowing the world to draw you away from your commitment to Jesus Christ Stop allowing the world to pull you into its mold so that you will think the way they think and act the way they act, behave the way they behave. That isn't who we are. As the Lord Jesus Christ has saved us from our sins and made us his children, we are new creations in Christ Jesus. We don't fit the world's mold. That's the reason they criticize the church. That's the reason they criticize you personally or persecute you or laugh at you or, or make some smart remark about you because you don't fit their mold. And because you don't fit their mold, you stand out. Because you don't fit their mold, sometimes you make them very uncomfortable. He says, listen, he says, you want God's best. You present your body a living sacrifice to Almighty God. You make a full surrender of yourself to him and do not allow yourself to be pulled away and remolded and shaped like the world. God's best blessings are going to come your way. God offers his best. He has prepared his best. And the truth is, I can either be satisfied with less than God has to offer, or I can ask the question, God, what would you do with me if I gave you my whole life? What would you send my way if I offered my life without reservation, without any bargaining, without any kind of, uh, of holding back in any area of my life? What would you do? What could you do? What are you willing to do? What do you want to do? One thing for certain, God has prepared the very best that he and his infinite wisdom and unconditional love can possibly provide for every single one of his children. Does that mean it'll always be what I want it to be? Not necessarily. Does that mean that if we offer ourselves in full surrender to him, that things will always go the way we want them to go? Absolutely not. 
because sometimes what we think is the best way is not the best way at all. And sometimes when we surrender our life to the Lord Jesus Christ, sometimes when we give ourselves in maybe some particular thing that he's dealing with in our life, things don't always turn out the way we expect them to, but one thing for certain, when we are fully surrendered, they will turn out for what is for our good, our best from the wisdom, listen, and the goodness and the love of Almighty God. So when he says in this passage, I urge you, I plead with you, I beckon you, listen, he says to present your bodies a living, holy sacrifice acceptable to God, the only kind that is acceptable to God. When we come to him in the right spirit saying, Lord, here is my life. Now you're asking the question, I'm sure, well, what do you mean by a sacrifice. What do you mean by full surrender? And I'm going to come to that in a few moments, but I just want you to realize here that when he makes this plea, that it is a literal practical thing. What he's saying is, I want you fully surrendered to me, fully and totally surrendered to me. Now somebody says, well, no, wait a minute. What right does God have to require me to be fully and committed and surrendered to him? I mean, what, what right does it have that? Well, let's look at it for a moment. First of all, the Bible says he's established his throne in the heavens and he rules over all. So he is the sovereign ruler of this universe. He has a right to dominate and to control our life. Secondly, the Bible says that he is the creator of all things. So since he created us, he certainly has the right to tell us how to live and what's best for us. Thirdly, he has saved us from our sins. And since he's our savior, he certainly has another right. And again, he sustains us every day. He's the one who keeps our heart beating. He's the one who keeps us alive. He sustains the whole universe every single day. And not only that, he is absolute, total owner and possessor of every single one of us. Now, he has the deed to your life. The tragedy is that many people trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior, and nobody ever told them, now that you've trusted Jesus as your Savior, you have given over all rights to him because he is the Lord. We sing about him being Lord. We talk about him being Lord. And we read the scriptures about him being Lord. But the truth is, we don't live out. We don't acknowledge in our daily life that he is the absolute Lord of our life. Because being Lord, he has absolute right, authority, ownership, control, and possession of our life. For example, look, if you will, in Romans chapter 8 for a moment. Or chapter 14. Chapter 14 and uh, verse 8. Romans 14, verse 8. Listen to what he says. He says, for if we live, we live for the Lord. Or if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. We belong to him. We are his by ownership, by creation. Then if you'll turn to 1 Corinthians for a moment, look at that sixth chapter, if you will. And listen to what Paul says here again about our relationship. He says in this uh, 19th verse, the sixth chapter, he says, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit that is indwelt by the Holy Spirit? He says, who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you're not your own? Look at that. You're not your own, but you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. He says that every single believer, listen, we surrendered ownership. We surrendered possession. The truth is all of our rights have been surrendered and yielded the moment we surrendered our life to Jesus Christ, we became his purchased possession. What did he purchase us with? With the blood of Jesus Christ. And the moment we were saved, we became his blood-bought purchased possession. So he has ownership. Now, one of the indications is of his ownership, we cannot see, but all of us who believe us know that it's there. He says in Ephesians chapter 1 that when you and I were saved, we were sealed by the Holy Spirit under the day of redemption, which means, if we could put this on our forehead somehow, that every single believer would have the stamp of ownership on their forehead, and all of us do have it on our heart, on our spirit, and that is we are owned by Almighty God. Therefore, when we act in rebellion, when we act in disobedience, we're acting other than who we are. We're the sons and daughters of God. We're ambassadors of the Lord Jesus Christ. We represent him. We belong to him. He owns us. He possesses us. And therefore, when I say, well, I want to have it my way, what I'm doing is I'm acting out of character of who we are. And so, therefore, when somebody says, well, who has any right to dominate and control my life? Almighty God. We are his by ownership, by possession. 
And so therefore, when you look at this passage and he says to us, he says, I urge you to present your body a living sacrifice. That is, he says, do what you ought to do, what is right for you to do. He's your owner. He's the one who possesses you. Everything that you have has come through him and come from him. Therefore, he has the right, he has the awesome right to demand that you and I walk in obedience to him. And that is that we live a surrendered life, yielded to him, totally given up. Now, so one of the bases of that call for full surrender is the fact of, of uh, who he is. But a second one is this, and that is simply this, that God has planned the very best for us. One of the reasons he calls for full surrender is because of what he wants to do for us. Now, look at this passage, because oftentimes we think, well, I don't know that God loves me and so forth. Look, if you will, in... Um, Jeremiah chapter 29. I want to give you two or three verses here that are just indications of what God wants to do in our life, that he has planned and he has the best provided for us. And so listen to what he says in this 29th chapter. He says in the 11th verse, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. Then you'll call upon me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You'll seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. Look at that. He says, for I know the plans that I have for you. God has a plan for us. What is his plan? Is his plan for you. No matter what you may think about your life and the past and what you don't have and what you could have and what you ought to have and what you should have and what you'd like to have, listen to what he says. He says, I have plans for you. What kind of plan is that? It is the best plan that an infinite, all-wise, and all-loving God could and would plan for you. It's the very best plan. And you, so you see, if I want to experience God's best, I must surrender my life to him so that he can do what? So that he can exercise that best in me so I can experience his best. But he's planned it. Go, if you will, to um, look in Psalm 31 for a moment. 31st Psalm and passage that I refer to every once in a while because I just want to rivet it into your heart. Uh, what he says in this passage. Psalm 31, look if you will in verse 19. The psalmist says, How great is your goodness which you have stored up for those who fear you. God says he stored up goodness. What did he say a few moments ago? He says, I have a plan for you. And that plan is good. Listen, God doesn't store up evil for us. He doesn't store up bad things for us. God stores up for the, uh, those things that are good for us. Now, does that mean everything he stored up for me I like? No. Everything he stood up for me that I will enjoy? No. Everything he stood up for me that I will thank him for? I ought to, but because some things he stood up for me, I don't like. But you know what? If he stored it up for me and he says it's good, it's got to be good. Because God will turn every single circumstance in our life for our good if we respond in a proper way. Look in the 34th Psalm. 34th Psalm. And notice, if you will, in the uh, 10th verse. He says, the young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they who seek the Lord shall not be one of any good thing. Why? Because he says, I have a plan for your life. And if I want God's best, then I must yield myself to him, surrender myself to him in order to be able to position myself so that I can enjoy, so can, I can receive, so that I can experience God's very best. Turn, if you will, to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, a passage that you certainly ought to circle and Memorize it or however you want to handle it, but certainly mark it in your Bible. Listen to this verse. Verse 31 says, What then shall we say to those things? If God is for us, who is against us? Listen, God is for every single one of his children. He is on the side of every single one of his children. He is looking out for every single one of his children. And so he says, He who did not spare his own son, speaking of God, not sparing... He did not spare Jesus, but delivered him over for us all, that is, in the crucifixion. How will he not also with him, that is, with Christ, freely give us all things? Listen, not stingily, but abundantly, freely give us all things. Oh, here's a God who has a plan for us. He says, we'll not want any good thing. He stored up goodness for us. And he says, here's what I want you to see. If I didn't reserve my only begotten son, if I didn't keep him to myself, and I gave you the very best that I have, is that not an indication of what you can expect from me in your life? You can expect the best. 
you can expect the very best that God could possibly conceive of and plan for your life. That is the very character of God. So God calls for a full surrender. Why? Because of who he is, he has the right to do it. And secondly, because he's planned the best for us. And so what you have to ask yourself in your life is this. Do I want God's best or I don't? I want something else. Am I willing to surrender my life completely to an infinitely all-wise God who has said in just these four scriptures, and there are hundreds of them that indicate that he's planned the best, he is a good God, he's reserved the best, he desires the best, he is willing to pour out the very best that he has in your life and my life. But listen, if I am not surrendered to him, he can't do it. I want to show you in a few moments why he can't. He cannot do it. So if we are needing and if we are dissatisfied and discontent and our Christian life's not what it ought to be and we don't think our relationship with the Lord is right, we don't feel intimacy with him, I'm telling you, listen, we're not waiting on God. God's waiting on us. He wants the very best. He's calling for a full surrender. He's calling for that which is not a sign of weakness but of strength. Listen, it's not a sign of weakness to give up to Almighty God to surrender everything to him, to yield everything to him. That's not a sign of weakness. It is a sign of weakness to hold on to myself and hold on to what I want and I have for fear of what may happen if I turn my life over to God. Oh, listen, those who in the power of the Holy Spirit, you surrender fully everything that you are and everything that you have, trusting him to see what he will do in your life. And you see, most people don't want to take any risk in life. They just don't want to keep everything secure, and so they won't take a, another job oftentimes because uh, there's the risk that they may not be able to do as well as they think they could or somebody else expects of them. And so some people, everybody wants to, these days seem to want to live in security. Let me tell you something. If you obey the living God, you're going to have to take some risk. But here's the awesome thing about risking with God. Well, how much risk is it when whatever you do, you're in the grip of the sovereign, omnipotent ruler of the universe who loves you absolutely. And listen, who will not let anything happen to you that is not good for you. Is that a risk or is it not? That's the kind of risk I want. Who wants to live the kind of life where everything is just sort of humdrum and I want to be sure that everything just works out right and I just I don't want to take any risk. Don't want to, I want to be careful. I know what God is saying, but, 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 but listen, God is going to require of us if we surrender ourselves to him, he's going to require us things that will challenge us. How do you think he grows us up? He grows us up by giving us challenges in our life, things that are difficult for us, things that are hard for us, things that oftentimes we don't like, we don't want, we would never choose. Why? Because we're seeing it from our viewpoint. When you see it from God's viewpoint, what we don't like and what's painful for us and uh, what's difficult for us and hurtful for us, what's God doing? Growing us up, maturing us. He says that's good. Whatever drives him to us to him is good. Whatever makes us Christ-like, God says, I've got good stored up for you. What I want is a life fully surrendered like a living, holy sacrifice so that I can pour out the best that I have and all that I have for you. Now, somebody says, well, you know, I, uh, I think that's a wonderful idea, and I would like to do that, uh, but um, what's the purpose of all that anyway? Well, let's talk about it for a moment. One of his purposes is this, this, is that God wants us fully surrendered to him because, listen, watch this now, he loves our worship. God loves for us to worship him. He's a jealous God. He wants us to worship him and him alone. So let me ask you a question. How can I come to church and worship God? In other words, I can sing and pray and read the scriptures or listen to a message or whatever it might be. How can I come to God and really worship him? That is, this is the living, sovereign God of the universe. How can I worship God at the same time reserving areas of my life for myself? That is, areas of my life that I don't want to surrender. Areas of my life that I don't want to give up. It may be thoughts that I don't want to give up. It may be anger and bitterness and resentment and vengeance that I have towards someone, and I don't want to give it up. Or it may be some habit in my life I don't want to give it up. It may be a relationship I don't want to give up. It may be some activity I don't want to give up. Maybe my job I don't want to give up. God says, I'm, I got something different, something better. Lay it down. Don't want to give it up. How can I come to God and genuinely and truly worship God and at the same time reserving areas of my life that I am unwilling to yield to him? I'm here to tell you it is not genuine, true worship. All the praying, all the singing, all the preaching, all the reading of the scripture, there's no substitute acceptable to God other than full surrender. 
God, I want you to have your way in my life, whatever that is. Not bargaining. Think about this, for example. Somebody says, well, now, here's what I think. Here's how I feel. I've told God, now, I'm willing to serve him. I read the scriptures. I pray. I do all these things. But I don't listen. If I, it seems to me that if I serve God and give my money and give my tithe and pray and do these things, I don't know why God has to get up here and meddle in this part of my life. Because after all, this is not important. Mm -mm. You know what? Every single part of our life is important to God. What would you think if you purchased someone's house? And uh, they agreed to move out in 30 days. So 30 days came and uh, uh, you moving your furniture in. Their furniture is moved out. And uh, all of a sudden you find this room that's locked and bolted. And there's no way for you to get in. So I bought this house. Bought the whole house. They said, well, we're keeping this room for ourselves. No, you're not. Oh, yeah. We keep in this room for ourselves. I, I bought this house. I paid for this house. And therefore, uh, this is my house. Well, it, it's your house except for that room. Let me ask you, what kind of relationship, well, watch this. What kind of relationship would you have with that person? Conflict. Let me ask you a question. How can I come to the Lord's house and worship him when there's some area of my life I refuse to surrender? It may be financial. It may be that God's been telling you to tithe for years and years and years. And you say, God, I'm going to praise you. I'm going to worship you. I'm going to serve you. I'm going to do all these things. 5% God's all I can handle. What you're saying is, I think about this. You're saying to this God whom you worship, I praise you, I worship you, but I don't trust you. It's real simple, isn't it? I mean, when this gets down to it, it's just real simple. How can I worship a God I don't trust? Lord, I know this is what you're saying that you want me to do in my life. God, I praise you. I worship you. I adore you. I bless your holy name. Hallelujah. Praise to God. But you can't have that part of my life. It doesn't even make sense. Now, I'm telling you, a lot of worship is not worship. How can I genuinely worship a God I don't trust? I won't. I may sing. I may pray. I may read his word but I'm not worshiping a God I don't trust. For example, is it not difficult even to love somebody you don't trust, let alone worship somebody you don't trust? You don't trust somebody, how are you gonna love them? It's real difficult to love somebody you don't trust. You certainly cannot worship, genuinely, truly worship, and listen, because to worship the living God is the pouring out of the total person. It's the pouring out of the total person in adoration and praise and thanksgiving and recognizing the majesty and the glory and the power and the omniscience, omnipotence, mercy and grace and love of God. But you can't have this. I don't trust you. You see, one of the reasons he wants the full surrender is because he wants genuine, true worship. A second reason he wants full surrender is because he wants our service for him to be effective and fruitful. Now, a person can serve the Lord without being fully surrendered. There's no question about that. And here's what happens. What the person doesn't realize, I, for example, I could get up here and preach, and if my life is not surrendered to him, you know what? You may get blessed to some degree, and you may learn some things that will help you. But you know what? If I do it and I'm not surrendered, I'm going to miss the blessing. And here's the devil's trick. And that is, what we don't realize is, if we are serving God in the flesh, the way we want to do it, we're going to have our way, what happens is, God may use some decisions that are made, or he may use what we say, but you know what? We're going to miss the blessing. And besides that, it's not going to have the impact it could have. So let me ask you a question. Think about this. Why do you want to live your life and not make the full impact? Why do you want to live your life and not receive the full blessing? Listen, why, why do you want a little bit when you can have more? Why do you want to be what you are when you can be something else? Why do we want to risk going through life, trying to figure things out, having our way when God's way is the best way and he is more than willing to show us what his way is? And when I see people, it grieves my heart to think, look what's going on in your life. Look what you can be. Look what you could do. Look what God does have for you but you insist on doing it your way. And so God wants service that has impact to it. He wants your life to count. 
And if your life is going to count and really be fruitful, listen, why only get two bushel of oranges off the tree when you can get a hundred bushels? Why plant two acres when you could plant a thousand acres? Why give God a little bit of your life when he deserves and demands it all in order to bless you to the fullest? I'm telling you the reason God's blessings are not flowing to so many people is simply because, listen, they're not flowing health-wise, they're not flowing financial-wise, they're not flowing relational, they're not flowing in different ways. Why? Because they absolutely refuse to give up, yield, surrender their total being to God, insist on having their way. And what happens is we suffer as a result. So one of the things he wants, he certainly wants worship. The second thing he wants is certainly he wants service. And third, now watch this. The third thing he wants is, listen, now watch this one. God wants freedom to bless us. He said, no, wait a minute. Is he omnipotent? Yes, he is. If he's omnipotent, I can't give him freedom. Well, let's see if that's true. Does God have principles by which he governs things? Yes, he does. Would God violate his own principles? No, he would not. What's one of his principles? Obedience brings blessing. Whatever we sow, we reap. What we sow, more than we sow, later than we sow. So therefore, what happens is when you and I fully surrender our life to him, we lay it all down. No bargaining. Think about this for a moment. How in the world can you bargain with God? Many people hear people say, when I, God, if you'll do thus and so, here's what I'm going to do. Let me ask you a question. Let's go back to what we said in the very beginning. To whom do we belong? God, right? Soul ownership. He owns us and all that we have. So let me ask you a question. What are you going to bargain with God with when you don't have anything anyway? You, you can't bargain with God. And so the whole idea of trying to manipulate, you can't manipulate God. And so we come to acknowledge we don't have any bargaining rights. We don't even have anything to bargain with. It's a matter of obedience or it's a matter of disobedience. And what he's simply saying here to us is this. He says, present your body a living sacrifice because, listen, in order to worship God properly, he's got to have all of me. In order for the service to be really and truly acceptable and really fruitful and make an impact, he's got to have all of us. And not only that, in order for God to be able to bless us the way he wants to, he's got to have freedom to do it. Now watch this. He's not going to violate his own principles. He's not going to violate his own character. So here's what he said. He said, whatever we sow, we reap what we sow, more than we sow, later than we sow. Blessing follows obedience. God, listen, cannot condone disobedience. He cannot condone rebellion. He does not overlook sin. He does not ignore our ignoring him and insisting on having our own way. So therefore, here's what we do. We say, God, I want you to bless me, and we slam the door. God, I want you to bless me, but we choke up the channel because we position ourselves so as because of the principles by which God operates, he's not going to pour the full, listen, the blessing upon us when we have refused, listen, to surrender every aspect of our life. Now, is it easy to give it all up? No, it's not. Is it the right thing to do? Yes, it is. Is it the wise thing to do? Yes, it is. And after it's done, we look back and say, thank God, thank God, thank God, you finally got me to see that it was the wisest thing to do to, to yield everything to you. Is it easy? No, it's not. Satan will give you all kinds of reasons, threaten you, listen. I mean, he'll send you all kinds of messages. We can come into that in a moment. But what I want you to say is that you want God's full blessing? He, listen, watch this. When you say God can't do something, somebody says, I can't believe you say that God can't do anything. He cannot act outside of his own character. That is his own self-imposed character. He is not going to violate his own law. So if we choose to have it our way, live in rebellion, disobey him, withhold things from him, let, let, just going to do it our way. You know what? He can't do it. So we're the ones who are responsible for the slowdown and the blessings of God. And some people live their whole life. And you know what? They'll complain all their life and look back and think, oh, God, why didn't this happen to me? And why didn't that happen to me? And why did this happen? And why did that happen? And the truth is because we decided we were smarter than God. God said, I want to fill your hands. You say, well, Lord, I'm willing, I'm willing for you to fill my hand, but it's like this. 
let's suppose I had a hundred dollar bill in my hand and that was very valuable to me and so I wouldn't open my hand. You said, I'll just exchange what I want to give you for what you have. I said, no. It's what I, hundred dollars, I haven't had any hundred dollar bills in a long time, so can't, can't let this go. And you pull out $10,000 and say, here's what you could have had if you'd opened your hand. I'm here to tell you, my friend, that is exactly the way most people are living their life. They're holding on to pennies when God has blessings innumerable. They're holding on, listen, holding on to what they can do in life when you can discover what God can do in your life. Why not discover what God can do in your life? Give him the privilege, and the privilege, listen, demands a full surrender of my life. Why? Listen to this. Because God, listen, if God pours out a full blessing, he wants to be in full control. Because, listen, watch this. You already know this. A lot of people can't even stand a little bit of blessing. What happens? God begins to bless them. Next thing you know, they've wandered off. They're back in the world. They've forgotten the source of their blessing, running their own life again, doing it their way. How can God give his best? How can he give all that he's planned unless we're willing to give him full, absolute, total, listen, authority, right, privilege, which is his anyway, to rule and to reign and to govern and to guide our life. Now, so let's think about something. Why do we reject? Why do we recoil? Why do we resist a full surrender of our life? Because we'll say, I know he's God. I know he loves me unconditionally. I know he has the best for me. I know he'll always do what's right for me. And yet, listen, we will, we will declare that we believe every bit of that. At the same time, when it comes to a full surrender, we resist it. We recall the, verse that, the words of total surrender. You know, I want to hear about God's love and goodness and answer prayer, but surrender and yieldedness and, uh, and sacrifice, I don't like those words. Why do we protest God's idea of wanting absolute control of our life? You know, when I hear somebody say, well, I'll tell you right now, I'm going to have it my way. Only for a while, brother. Only for a while. It doesn't make any difference how much they accumulate, how much prestige, prominence, power, and all the rest. You know what? When you're having it your way, there's something very important missing in your life. And besides that, the things that people are trying to fill up their life with have no eternal value whatsoever. They cannot make, listen, there's only one thing that can make you happy. There's only one thing that can make you joyous. There's only one thing that can give you some real security, and that is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. All that other stuff is just stuff that's passing away and will turn to ashes one of these days. But what about it? Why is it we recoil? Number one, fear. That's interesting, the attitude people have about God. For example, somebody says, well, you know, I'm just afraid to make a full surrender because I'm afraid of what God may require of me. Now, what does that say? It says that my idea about God is this. He's sitting up in heaven, and he's just waiting for the day for me to give full surrender, and then he's going to put it on me. That's the attitude people have. They say, well, he may call me to be a missionary. Anything wrong with that? He may call me to preach the gospel. Anything wrong with that? He may take my family. God's not in the business of taking your family. He may burn my house down. In other words, God may test me. Friend, he can test you whether you surrender to him or not. That's not the way God thinks. You know what we've done? We've projected on God of being this judgmental God sitting in his throne in heaven, just waiting to do something that is difficult upon his children. That's, where is this God of goodness and love and mercy? That's the kind of God we're talking about. Why would you be afraid of fully surrendering? But that is exactly why most people do not. Afraid of what, or what will happen. So here's what Satan does. When God begins to deal with your heart about a full surrender, Satan says, mm-mm, now watch this. Suppose God tells you to leave your job. Suppose God tells you to move to another city. Suppose God calls you to the mission field. Suppose God takes away this, and suppose God takes away, you know what, what's Satan doing? Interjecting all of these negative thoughts. Suppose this, and if that, and but that, and when this, and what that. That's not the God that you and I know. Listen, this is not, a, this is not the heavenly Father the Bible tells us he is. So people are afraid, but you know what, it's false fear. 
What do you and I have to fear when we have an unconditional love in God who's provided us? He says, I've planned the best for you. Have a plan for you. He says, it's for welfare. It's good, not calamity. So people are afraid. They're afraid to surrender. Listen, now ask yourself this question. God wants me to give myself fully and absolutely and totally to him. Now, what is it I'm afraid of? And if you will analyze what you're afraid of, it, it has no basis whatsoever. But there's a second reason. The second reason is because of our own sense of selfishness. We don't want even God dictating to our life, telling us what to do, telling us how to do it, and telling us when to do it. We just don't want God doing that. Now, we're willing to pray, go to church, read the Bible, do all those other things, but we don't want God telling us how to run our life. Well, let me ask you a question. Does that mean that you and I are smarter about how to run our life than God is? That's what the implication is. You see, there has to be a reason. There is a reason in our thinking. I didn't say it was a good reason, a right reason. There has to be a reason that we are responding to God by withholding from Him our total being, our total self. Has to be a reason. It certainly can't be because He's bad, because He's evil, because He'll mistreat us, or any of those things. It has to be because something in our thinking is not correct. Why would you not surrender your life totally and completely to a God who has your best in mind, who's planned the best for you, who's promised you the best, who loves you unconditionally, who's written your name in the Lamb's Book of Life, who's forgiven you of your sins, who's going to take you home to heaven and spend all eternity with you? Why would you not do it? You see, living a life that is not totally surrendered doesn't even fit who we are. For example, if I came in here on a Sunday morning, and instead of wearing this side size coat, suppose I, I came in here, mine's about a 41, suppose I came in here with about a 60 size on. In other words, three of us could get in it. And my trousers were three inches longer than these and about a 50 in the waist. And a shirt collar that about two of us get our neck in. If I walked out here on Sunday morning, here's what you'd say. That doesn't fit him, right? That doesn't fit him. That doesn't fit him. You know what? Living a life that is not fully surrendered to our Lord doesn't fit us. It's, listen, it's totally out of order of who we are. And so, for example, suppose my pen decided my pen, for example, is totally committed to me, totally surrendered to me. I can take it apart. I can write with it. I can put it in my pocket, step on it, stop it, or keep it forever. Totally surrendered to me. Suppose my pen said, you can turn this, but I'm not going to write. Paul said, you can, you can put out the tip, but you can't put it back in. So when you put it in your pocket, it'll show before long all over your shirt. The only reason this pen is of any value whatsoever, it is absolutely, totally surrendered to my will. Acting any other way but in full surrender doesn't even fit who we are. Who are we? We're the purchased sons and daughters. But listen, we are owned by him. We are owned by him. He has the rights on us. We have no right. And imagine us telling an omnipotent God, you can't have all of me, but be like this pen saying, I'm not going to write for you. And anybody whom the Lord has called to preach the gospel, the mission field, or serve him in any way, my friend, for you to tell almighty sovereign God that you're not going to do it, have you thought about how serious that is? God's called you to teach a Sunday school class of young boys who need a father image. They come from broken homes, no father, looking for somebody to be an influence in their life. And you say, God, I'm not going to do that. Can't listen, do you think, do you realize what you're telling God when he owns you, he possesses you, he has the right to control, he can swipe you out and never even bat one of his divine eyes. And you're telling him, no. My friends, you haven't been thinking very wisely that you're going to tell God no about any aspect of your life. He has a right to call for full surrender. And we protest it because we're selfish and because we have an erroneous view of God and because our attitude is such that we think he's going to abuse us in some fashion. Now, with that in mind, let's get down to the hard, cold fact of what is and what is involved in this whole issue of making a full surrender. I want you to jot down three words. 
Here's what is involved in making a full surrender of your life to Christ. Now remember this. Say two things. When you got saved, more than likely, nobody ever told you what you've heard this morning. You just got saved. You, they told you you was going to go to heaven when you died, and that was good enough for you then. You did the best you could. You read your Bible and prayed. So I'm not being critical. I know exactly how it is. Nobody told me anything about that either. And so you sort of struggled through your life and made decisions on your own, never thinking about, for example, that God's interested in your job, or God's interested in your family, or God's interested in your children, or God's interested in why you're going to school. In other words, you just sort of made those decisions. God's been interested in every single one of those. So I'm not being critical. I'm just simply saying, I want you to understand something. Three words. The first word is definite. Definite. The second word is deliberate. And the third word is voluntary. Now think about this. By definite, I mean a specific decision. By deliberate, I mean carefully evaluated, thought about it, thought through it. Voluntary, that is, it is an act of your will, a choice that you've made. What is involved in a full surrender? It is a definite, deliberate, voluntary transfer of undivided possession, control, and use of our entire being, body, soul, and spirit to the Lord Jesus Christ to whom we rightfully belong. That's what a full surrender requires. A deliberate, definite, voluntary transfer. What we're saying is this. We're saying, God, from this point on, I've had it my way, but from this point on, it's your call. Whatever you want, that's what I want. That's what I'm going to do. Whatever you require, that's, that's what I'm going to do. Wherever you say go, that's where I'm going. Whatever you want, that's what I want. And when I don't want it, I'm going to trust you and obey you even when I don't want what you say. There may be something in my flesh, and it's not easy oftentimes to be obedient. But you know what? It's not a matter that I always feel good about it. It's the matter that I acknowledge his right to require. And a life fully surrendered has transferred, listen, undivided, so that I don't have, I'm not running part of the show and he's running part of the show. I'm not, it's not part of me and part of him doing this. It's not part of his possession and I'm claiming something for myself. Undivided, undivided possession, control, and use of our total being, body, soul, and spirit transferred to Jesus Christ and rightfully belongs. Only then is he practically the Lord of my life. Here's what that requires. Here's what it calls for. Lord, here's my life. No reservations, no bargaining, total, absolute surrender. Is that difficult? Yes, it is. Listen to this. That's why he sent the Holy Spirit to enable you and me, listen, to trust him. That when we yield everything to him and surrender everything to him, in a definite, deliberate, voluntary decision on our part, that from that point on, watch this, if he owns us, he possesses us, he's responsible for us. God assumes full responsibility for the life fully surrendered to him. You cannot lose. There is no way to lose. He assumes full responsibility for the life fully surrendered to him. And here's what you're going to discover. When you make that full surrender of your life to him, things that used to worry you, cause you anxiety, cause you fear, cause you to lack security, are going to disappear. You know why? Because what you've done, you have willfully placed your whole entire being, present and future, every aspect of your life in the hand of a sovereign, all-loving God who has taken, listen, full responsibility for caring for you, using you, blessing you, or doing whatever he chooses to do with your life. So what do I have to worry about? What do I have to fret over? What do I have to be anxious over if he's in control? Now, you know what gets us out of sorts? We get in control. We try to manipulate. 
We try to th make things work the way we want to work. We want them to go on our schedule. What's happening? You know what? Then I get anxious, get impatient, maybe get angry or whatever it might be because I am trying to control my life. When I've said, Lord, up to you. So think about this. If he, and he does, not if, but since he assumes full responsibility for what is totally surrendered to him, what once would have caused me pain no longer causes me pain. What once would have caused me hurt does not hurt. What once would have made me lonely does not make me lonely. What once I may have caused, caused me to be angry no longer caused me to be angry. Why? Because he's in control and he's fully aware of every aspect of our life. And you know what? Is he's fully aware? He allows something in our life. What's he doing? He's doing something for our good because there's some things in your life, as we said before, we want to lose. We want to lose our bad remembrances of the past. We want to lose anger, lose bitterness, lose resentment, give up hostility, give up ideas of vengeance. What do we want to do? We want to just let God control our life. You say, now, wait a minute. Is that a one-time thing? Now, listen carefully. I do believe that there's a point in the person's life where they understand what we are talking about. And for the first time in their life, their life, they recognize, genuinely, truly recognize that he has a right for absolute control. And they make that decision. Lord Jesus, I choose to make a definite, deliberate, voluntary transfer of all possession, all control, and all use of my life. No exception, no reservation. Transfer to you, Lord Jesus to do with me what you choose, when, where, and how. I think there is a definite time. Now, following that, every time a decision comes up that would cause me to want to lean and move in from some other direction, I have to renew. I must renew my position, fully surrendered. Yes, Lord, fully surrendered. And this is one of the wonderful things about your time of prayer and meditation. Because what happens every time you get on our, we get on our knees and we, we get into the Word and read, asking God to speak to our heart, what happens? It is a wonderful time, and it should certainly be daily, at a minimum, daily, to say, Lord, I want you to check my life. Is there anything that I've tried to take control of today? Is there any aspect of my life, Lord, that I'm trying to want to manipulate? I, I, I just lay that down. I just reaffirm total, full surrender. I want you to be absolute boss because I trust you much better than I trust myself. You know what? It's really very simple when you look at it. Obey God. Leave all the consequences to him because he assumes full responsibility for the life fully surrendered to him. He calls for a full surrender. Listen. Because he wants the best for us. And those who are willing to make that surrender will experience a joy they have never known, a peace they have never known, a confidence they have never known, a sense of security they have never experienced. That is the gift. And so much more. If you're willing to trust him with your whole life, which belongs to him anyway. And what you're saying in essence is this. No longer will I have it my way. From this point on, I want it your way. And Father, how grateful we are. You've put up with us for so long. You watch us struggle and fret and fume over things. And there you sit upon your throne with the very best that you could possibly offer, waiting to bestow it upon us when we position ourselves in obedience and surrender to you to pour out your blessing upon us. I pray that every person who hears this message would stop and think seriously about their life, where they're headed, what they may have missed, what they don't want to miss, and be wise enough to say, all to Jesus I surrender, all to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him, and in his presence by the power of the Holy Spirit, daily live, fully committed, fully surrendered. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.